all countries, whether we're talking North Korea, Malawi, Chile, Sweden, or the United States, they're all run primarily by their bureaucracy and not by their official leaders. Now, that's not to say that the leaders, whether elected or not, have no say in how the country is run, but their role is much more limited than it would seem at a first glance for the casual observers. In the West, this bureaucracy is usually commonly referred to as the civil service. But the name civil service does not embody the totality of individuals and structures that indeed do run a country. A much better name for this totality is the deep state. Now what is the deep state? How can it be built or toppled and why it matters? These are our topics for this episode. Let's explore. Hello everyone, and welcome to another installment of Freedom Alternative Research and Analysis. Now this video is meant to be philosophical, although as promised, practical politics will get its fair share. So in this video we will answer three questions. 1. What is the deep state and what is the history? 2. How it works in practice, and this is where I'll come up with as many examples as I can, and three, how to create it or steer its direction. So, without further ado, let us begin. Now, the concept of a deep state is not exactly something new. The name itself, however, was popularized by the former Turkish prime, uh, president Süleyman Demirel, who postulated the existence of a deep state within the Turkish state, basically a state within a state, that has a certain direction that it imposes upon the country regardless of what anyone else outside of the deep state thinks. He then proceeded to describe this deep state as consisting mostly from the military, the Kemalist elites and certain judges who keep the country in a mostly nationalist, mostly capitalist, mostly secularist and mostly anti-Islamic direction. Consequently, the deep state was and is responsible, in Demirel's view, of the fact that the Kurdish whining uh, cause isn't advancing, responsible for the suppression of Islam in the Turkish public life, and of course responsible for the fact that no matter how many times the Islamists vote for Islamist parties, nothing changes. Thus, Demirel post postulated, the deep state is inherently anti-democratic. Now, mind you, this thesis proposed by Suleiman Demirel was postulated roughly 20 years ago in mid-1990s, prior to the apprehension of Abdullah Ocalan of the PKK and prior to the events that did prove beyond reasonable doubt that such a deep state actually did exist. We've seen how Recep Erdogan's revolution ended up with the purge of the state. Most of those purged did look like being carefully selected for purging, and they were carefully selected, and they were the Turkish deep state. Suleyman Demirel postulated the idea as being something rather unique to Turkey. But what if such a deep state is actually not a quirk of the tumultuous Turkish Republic, but rather the absolute norm in all countries on earth, regardless of their form of government or the style of governing? What if the existence of a deep state is rather unavoidable in any country? Now mind you, these are not rhetorical questions. Because the concept of the deep state is contentious and, dare I say, controversial every time it's being brought up anywhere in the world. One of the reasons this is the case is because it always does make one sound a bit conspiratorial whenever one brings up the existence of a deep state. And the reason this is the case is because most of the time individuals making the case for the existence of a deep state usually fail to mention that its existence is rather inevitable and it doesn't necessarily have to be coordinated or conspiratorial, although sometimes it is. 
Basically, the deep state are the people who, at least in theory, have to effectively enforce the law and run the institutions meant to implement the leadership's vision of reality. Whenever the individuals populating such institutions are too homogeneous in terms of worldview, but not necessarily ideology, whenever this happens, the existence of a deep state emerges. And that's how we move to the second part of the video, how the deep state works in practice. Alright, this is a bit complicated, so hopefully I won't make a mess out of the description. Hopefully the examples that I will provide will mitigate this. So, example number one, Sweden. Now, Sweden is not on any scholar's radar when it comes to the discussion of a deep state, but then again, I'm not a scholar. Now, joke aside, Sweden is a very good example. Just last week, Svenska Dagbladet wrote about the militant activism of the deep state for ruining the country entirely. Basically, even the cucked political establishment of the country, led by Stefan Löfven, reached to the sensible conclusion that too many immigrants, especially from Islamic places, is simply not a good idea. As a result, the Löfven government ordered an unprecedented shutdown of the borders and a drastic increase of deportations and a tightening of conditions of awarding asylum to every schmuck that happens to arrive in the country. But that doesn't mean the problem will be solved or even begin to matter. Why? Because of the deep state, in this case the Migrahundsverket, which is basically the Ministry for Immigration. The employees of Migrahundsverket, or the Swedish Migration Board, the Ministry for Immigration, the employees from there decided unilaterally that they know better and, as a result, used every trick in the book to get asylum to as many migrants as possible before the government could even begin to start thinking about doing something about this outrage. Did anyone force these employees to do this? Nope. Did some shadowy force uh, order them uh, or anything of that sort? Nope. What did happen is that most of the employees of the Migration Board are hardline open borders leftists. And this is true in other countries as well. Hardline leftists are overrepresented in such bureaucracies when compared to the general population. But in Sweden, this issue is particularly egregious considering the corridor of opinions, a notion, a notion which Swedes are abysmally familiar with. <clears throat> and considering that the country overall is significantly more leftist than probably anyone else in Europe. The existence of the deep state in Sweden has been confirmed beyond reasonable doubt over a decade ago when the revelations of the SVT documentary Schönskriget, or The Gender War, uh, where the people involved in uh, imposing extremist, radical feminist misandrist policies upon the people of Sweden basically admitted on camera that they did not coordinate intentionally, intentionally, but they just happened to all have a mutual, unspoken, ideological agreement that predated the opportunity to do such damage to begin with. In other words, they've all been groomed long ago for this and as such, no further coordination or other conspiratorial action was needed. The subversion had been done in advance and now they'd do their thing on basically autopilot. Now are you scared yet? Because there's more. Example number two, the United Kingdom. The UK is also a place that rarely comes up in discussions about the deep state, and I don't understand why this is the case, since the UK is probably one of the few places where the existence of the deep state is pretty much open knowledge. Now, do you remember the Rotherham fiasco? Well, we were told at the time that the authorities did not intervene for so long out of fear of being called racists. Now, that is indeed true, but nobody dared to ask why. That was the case. Now, as far as I'm aware, only one commentator correctly identified one of the links. Pat Condell, when he talked about the organization Common Purpose, which he called a cultural Marxist propaganda organization and a, quote, secretive left-wing Freemasonry, close quote, in his video called The Real Enemy Within. Pat Condell didn't use the phrase deep state, but that's exactly what he was describing in his video.
Even now you get the sense that nobody involved in this scandal believes they did anything wrong and that most of them would behave the same way again if they thought they'd get away with it. It's a, a curious mindset that seems to transcend normal values, as if their minds had been programmed and trained in some way, almost as if they shared some kind of sinister common purpose. And this, coincidentally, is what I would like to know. How many of these Rotherham racists have been officially brainwashed by a cultural Marxist propaganda organisation called Common Purpose? If you don't know anything about these people, they are worth looking into. Common Purpose is a registered charity that's been described as a kind of secretive left-wing Freemasonry. It offers what it calls leadership development programmes to selected, progressive-minded candidates, training them how to operate the levers of power behind the scenes and how to work within a network of like-minded others to move society in a more progressive direction, whether people want it or not. Training them to lead beyond authority, as they put it, a telling phrase. People are selected for their potential to occupy positions of influence in, say, the media or in what's laughingly called public service, so that progressive, politically correct ideas can then infiltrate and permeate every level of society and push it in the right direction, I mean the correct direction, without anyone's knowledge or permission. This is what they mean by a common purpose. And they're very secretive about what they actually teach people, so there's a lot of justifiable suspicion about their activities and their motives, especially since government departments and other public bodies like the BBC, the police, the NHS and and others have been persuaded to spend thousands of pounds of public money sending people to be trained on these secretive social engineering courses. It's been happening now for many years and thousands of these graduates, as they're called, have now been trained. Many of them occupy key positions in all these dysfunctional, diversity-obsessed, management-laden organisations, including, of course, local government, where they're particularly active and where they're free to exert their malign influence on an unsuspecting community of normal people. But common purpose is not the deep state. Common Purpose is just one of the many actors that do understand that the emergence, functioning and existing of a deep state is unavoidable and thus they compete in the attempt to control that said deep state. In other words, they play the game that matters. They are the smart folk. There are countries in Europe, most of them in Eastern Europe, but also Austria and Finland, where the deep state is conservative. That's how it is possible for Finland or Romania to have nominally open borders governments but still be the countries that deport the highest amount of immigrants per capita. I mean, just recently the Romanian Migration Inspectorate announced that last month they deported 7 people per day. That's a lot for the standards of this country. Meanwhile, in Finland, organizations such as the Sons of Odin and other local organizations that are busy convincing the immigrants to leave are never, and I mean ever, hit by the police or generally have their activities seriously infringed upon by the authorities. Why? Because just like in Romania, the deep state agrees with them. In other words, the deep state is conservative. Now let me give you a more extreme example. North Korea. In North Korea, uh, trading used to be a capital offense. So was conducting a private transportation business unsanctioned by the party. Both of these offenses are now the absolute norm in the country. Not because the dictator had a change of heart, but because the deep state, the bureaucracy that actually runs the country, decided that it's no big deal. Now, rumor has it that Kim Jong-un lost the support of the deep state almost entirely, but since I have no evidence of that, I will refrain from further judgment. What is, however, beyond reasonable doubt uh, true is that more and more North Koreans defy the official framework and they do it so bluntly that the only way they can do that is because the boots-on-the-ground enforcers simply refuse on a systemic level to enforce the official party line. Whether Kim Jong-un and the deep state are in good relations or not is up for debate, but it is no longer up for debate uh, that outside the capital city the control of the party is smaller than ever before and that markets are slowly taking over with the tacit approval of the local apparatchiks. 
the deep state, whether intentional or not, has become bourgeois. That's why I'm very confident that the current regime in DPRK will change by 2030, most likely a lot earlier than that. Not because I think the wider North Korean population will manage to create a serious uprising, not because foreign intervention, and not because there will be a wide consensus that the current regime is insane. The Kim regime will, so will fall solely because the deep state is no longer willing to uphold it it will slowly but surely collapse via implosion. Now, that implosion could be peaceful or could be violent, but implosion is, at this point, rather inevitable. So, now that we have at least a vague idea on how the deep state works in practice, let's dive into the third question of the video. How to create it or how to steer its direction if it already exists? It being, of course, the deep state. Now, there is no definitive answer to this question. Whoever tells you that he has the final answer to this question is probably trying to, tell you, to sell you something or is simply ill-informed and lacking a global and historical perspective on these things. Basically, the deep state can take any form imaginable and it usually represents the wider society at a given time. And this is very important. There are many situations where the deep state doesn't represent the society at a given time, but that always happens either because the society has changed whilst the deep state did not, or because the deep state represents a certain societal model that the rest of the society has yet to change into. The latter situation was the case in Turkey, and it was one of the few situations of this kind. Most of the time, the deep state usually emerges naturally as a consensus of the state of affairs of a given time. So, for instance, in Britain or Sweden, the deep state represents the urban societal consensus as it was in mid-1990s or early 2000s when the idea of Muslim immigration being dangerous <clears throat> was rather marginal because the crimes of Islam within Sweden or Britain had yet to manifest themselves in the extreme form that we've seen in the last five years. Basically, the deep state is the ultimate step. Wisdom tells us that politics is downstream from culture. Andrew Breitbart postulated that politics is 20 years downstream from culture. Now, he wasn't necessarily wrong, just a bit in inaccurate. The deep state is 20 years downstream from culture. Politics, in general, are usually less than that. Still downstream, but not 20 years. Roughly 10 years downstream from culture. Now, these values uh, uh, vary uh, incredibly. <clears throat> depending on the issue. But the main point still does remain. Culture is the avant-garde, politics is the main step, and the deep state is the ultimate goal. Alright, so, in fewer words, political operatives should aim to create a deep state or subvert the existent one. And this is where we, as non-leftists, are usually behind in most of Europe and North America. And this is where I hope Trump will get it. He may be the president uh, uh, and get to make so many glorious picks, but the deep state at the federal level is still leftist. And has been since mid-1990s, with the notable exception of the FBI and some sectors of the CIA, which is not exactly under direct authority of the government. Long story here, not getting into that now. The big advantage in America is that at local levels, the deep state is still largely conservative. So the mission should be to take some of that awesomeness and bring it on on federal level and ferment an ossified deep state that works a lot more, well, conservatively than it does now. Now, doing that will ensure a continuation of a Trump-like attitude and agenda, even if the next, uh, the next administration will be Democrat. Reagan was the last president who understood this. History now notes that his era was one where the country as a whole shifted rightwards. And that is true, but Reagan also took that shift and used it to ossify a deep state that took decades to tear apart. Most of that the deep state was alive and well in 2000, and even some of, those, some of it as late as 2009. That is what Trump needs to do. Now, I don't know if he will do it, but I sure hope he does. 
All right. So, uh, how do you de how do you build a deep state? Well, as I was saying, there are no definitive answers, but there are a few guidelines which tend to be quite obvious. It first depends on where you are. If you are the president, the guide guidelines are obviously different than when you are a political operative, an agitator, or a cultural influencer. Since I don't assume that there are presidents and prime ministers watching this video, I will only focus on, well, us. So, the first step towards building a deep state is to build private structures in the form of think tanks and training or school facilities, schooling facilities aimed at agitprop and particularly at propagandizing their members. Basically, we need our own version of the common purpose, and this is particularly true in Europe and Canada. In the US, they do have, at the very least, an American Enterprise Institute, the Hoover Institution, and quite a few other think tanks that do the heavy lifting. But what do we have in Europe? There is one decent think tank, de facto led by Branislav Wildstein in Warsaw, the Bioethics Institute in Brussels, and that's pretty much it in terms of institutions. We don't have a common purpose of the right. An organization that can groom the next generation of civil service bureaucrats that would quietly but consistently steer the bureaucracy our way. And that is the second step. Grooming our representatives. You can't just perpetually expect for new voices to emerge. I mean, ju that's just inefficient. The left has been quietly grooming its people for decades and tirelessly working at subverting institution after institution. They don't call it the long march through institutions for nothing. In my video, Leftism as a Luxury Problem, I advise individuals to do their best to influence the local politics in their own communities, particularly the education and school politics in which their children or their friends' children study. That's one step towards creating a deep state, because the deep state means all sorts of bureaucrats, including school administrators, school inspectors, local town hall bureaucrats, and many, many other bureaucrats who are rarely, if ever, changed by an election, but who actually do run important aspects of our lives. For instance, many of these anti-Christmas bylaws and policies that ban or restrict Christmas celebrations or replace them with season's greetings or other similar nonsense, many, if not most of these, are not the result of elected officials' decisions, but the result of small-time bureaucrats that are part of the leftist deep state. That's it. These are the two main steps. Everything else is merely details. Build the institutions and start grooming and propagandizing. And do this for 20 years. Then, and only then, when at least one generation of our people are successfully infiltrated in most, if not all, bureaucracies, then we can talk about a deep state. As always, Americans have a big edge in this. If they're helped by the Trump administration, and by God I hope they are, they can do all of this in four years, since they already have most of the needed institutions and infrastructure and most of the people they need. With help from the administration, they can successfully re-subvert the deep state a lot faster. The biggest problems are basically here in Europe, particularly Central and Northwestern Europe. The East and the South will still be just fine. In Southern Europe, the deep state is already conservative and will continue to be so for many years. All our people need, need to do is to just support it, uphold it. And the same goes in Eastern Europe, with the possible exception of Czechia. The deep wounds are undoubtedly Sweden, Britain, France and Germany, particularly Germany, where there have been four generations now that have been intentionally, institutionally and successfully cucked into accepting absolute leftist authority. Now, untangling that is not an easy task. The AFD is a good vector for politics of the next year, but for the German deep state, a lot more planning and a lot more people are going to be needed. Quite frankly, I am not that optimistic, but I would be glad to be proven wrong. Anyway, 
There is a lot more to be talked about the deep state, but I hope I at least outlined the basics of the concept so I can refer everyone to this video whenever I use the term deep state in the future, just like I did with the term agitprop, which for a few months I mistakenly assumed that it's a known term. And with all of that being said, thank you for watching, thank you for your generous and continuous support for this channel, and um, I'll see you around on Freedom Alternative.